To understand precision and accuracy, let's play a dart game. The goal is to hit the center target, which is worth 10 points. The closer you get, your points go up. The first time you play, you'll probably scatter your darts all over the board. This is neither accurate nor precise. You'll get better with practice. Robin throws darts and they all hit the edge, which is worth one point each. Over and over, within a millimeter, all of her darts hit one point. She has good precision, but not very good accuracy. William hits the bullseye a couple of times, but he also hits spots farther out, worth two and three points. He has better accuracy than Robin, but he is not nearly as precise. See the spread of his darts? Daryl can do both. He hits the bullseye every time, and within the bullseye, all of his darts are very close to each other. By hitting the target, he is highly accurate. By placing the darts all close to each other, he is very precise. It's easy to confuse these two concepts, because when you're trying to hit a target, if you are accurate, you are probably also fairly precise. That's why we should take a close look at Robin's game. If she got a score for how close all of her darts are to each other, she would score very well for precision. Compare William. Although he gets a higher score than Robin for accuracy, he gets a worse score for precision. The average distance between his darts is quite high. Another way you can think of this is his repeatability. Robin can hit the same spot over and over. It's just not the right spot. William can hit the right spot some of the time, but there's less certainty about how far he will be from that target. Daryl is the clear winner for both precision and accuracy. This dart game helps us understand accuracy and precision are related but distinct concepts. You can have a situation where shots are precise but not accurate, clustered but away from the target center, accurate but not precise, spread out but centered on the target, both accurate and precise, clustered around the center, or neither accurate nor precise, spread out randomly. Now let's take that experience and compare it to making a measurement. What if we're talking about carpenters cutting a piece of wood? Here's a trick that a lot of builders use. Rather than carrying around a measuring tape, they measure their other tools ahead of time, so they have a quick way to roughly measure how long something is. You can hold up your hammer and know how long that is. It's not as good as a measuring tape, but for quick jobs, it's often good enough. Jen always uses this hammer. She measured its length once when she bought it and got 30 centimeters. So if she wants to cut a piece of wood that is 30 centimeters in length, she feels pretty good about using her hammer to measure that length before cutting. That level of precision is perfectly fine for rough work, like, for instance, cutting pieces of wood roughly the same length to be stakes in the garden. But what if she needs to be more careful, creating something that has to be just right, like cutting pieces of wood to make a cupboard where every side needs to match, or there will be gaps when you try to put the box together, and it'll be crooked and not very strong. In that case, Jen should use another tool that allows her to make a more precise measurement, a ruler or a tape measure with markings for tenths of centimeters will allow Jen to make pieces that are all closer to each other in length, more precise measurements. If Jen is relying on her hammer that was measured as 30 centimeters, now she has uncertainty about how many tenths of centimeters there are. She might cut 30.1, 30.2, 30.3, 29.5, 30 sometimes exactly 30.0, but she will be creating lengths of wood that are only as precise as her measuring tool. But if she measures the length with a ruler that has tenths of centimeters listed, she can make a mark and cut at 30.0 centimeters. Now there will still be a level of uncertainty, but the uncertainty is at the next level, 
the hundredth of a centimeter. So if Jen uses a ruler with tenths of centimeters marked, she will wind up with lengths that are 30 .01, 30.01, 30.02, 30.03, 29.99, 30.00. Zero you see, these pieces of wood will still have slight variations, of course, but by using a more precise measuring tool, you can see how the precision, similarity, closeness to each other improves. This is assuming that Jen is measuring accurately. She can't let her finger slip around and make a measurement in the wrong place or cut farther away from the mark. In order to be a good carpenter, if you want to achieve clean, symmetrical design, you need to be both accurate and precise. What about volumes? Similar idea. You get a lot of practice measuring volumes at your lemonade stand. You need one glass of water, four tablespoons of lemon juice, and one tablespoon of sugar to make your family's favorite lemonade. It's pretty tart. You're not overly precise about these measurements. It's not so important that every glass of lemonade has the exact same measurements every time. But what if one day you sell a glass of lemonade in your lemonade stand to a nice fellow named Joe who has a chain of grocery stores? He gives you a contract to make 100 liters of lemonade every week. For Joe's grocery store customers, it's very important that every glass of lemonade is identical. What tools would you use to make these vats of perfectly identical lemonade? Would you still use a glass and eyeball the glass of water measurement? Which is about 350 milliliters, by the way. Or would you use a graduated cylinder with markings at every 10 milliliters? Which of these allows you to be more precise? If you use a drinking glass to measure out your water, you might miss the target, accuracy, as well as get varying amounts each time, precision. Using tools with volumetric markings lets you be both more accurate and more precise. Home cooks often use tablespoons and measuring cups for measuring out dry ingredients like sugar and flour. But if you get more serious about baking, you'll switch to a kitchen scale that measures to the tenth of a gram. In chemistry lab, we call this piece of equipment a balance. Here's why it makes a difference. One tablespoon of sugar has a lot of wiggle room. How rounded is it? You might be able to add a little more or a little less sugar sometimes and not even realize it. But if you measure the mass of your sugar on a kitchen scale, one tablespoon converts to about 12.5 grams of sugar. This allows you to make this measurement more accurately than eyeballing how perfectly rounded is your tablespoon. Now let's talk about precision for dry ingredients. If you have a balance that measures to the tenth of a gram, you can measure 12.5 grams. There is some uncertainty for the next digit. Is it actually 12.50? Or is it 12.51, 12.52? That's the measure of precision. If you measure your sugar 10 times, there will be variation to this degree. If you keep your eyes open, you'll see a lot of examples in your daily life where we are okay being just roughly correct in terms of both accuracy and precision. But when it comes to science and engineering, we take care to improve both. You can always hashtag learn more at Socratica.com.